Hello everyone, my name is Jen Nolan and on behalf of Musculoskeletal Australia, I'd like to warmly welcome you to our webinar this evening on the topic of common shoulder problems. I'd like to begin, however, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land from which we are broadcasting, the Boomerang people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. If you haven't previously viewed our, web, our website, I strongly suggest you do so. On the Musculoskeletal Australia website, we have our online shop, as well as a wide range of information, videos, recordings of our previous webinars, tools and services, including our national helpline that is available via email and phone on 1800 263 265. In addition to the remaining webinars in our community webinar series, we have our annual Coadlo Community Lecture coming up on Wednesday the 7th of September. This year's free online lecture will be titled Working Wise, Managing Your Musculoskeletal Conditions and Work. We have three great speakers and everyone who is currently registered for our community webinar series will be automatically registered for our Coadlo Lecture. Our presenter for this evening is Dr. Sarah Wormsley. Sarah is a musculoskeletal physiotherapist with over 30 years experience in both the clinical and academic settings. She has an interest in, di in the diagnosis and management of shoulder disorders and has undertaken research in the early diagnosis, uh, diagnosis of adhesive capsulitis. She is currently a lecturer at the University of Newcastle in Australia, as well as a clinician working in a specialised upper limb practice. Sarah has published in peer-reviewed journals and presented her research findings at both national and international conferences. We are extremely grateful to Sarah for presenting this evening's webinar. And without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to her. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thank you, Jen, and uh, many thanks to Musculoskeletal Australia for giving me the opportunity to speak this evening. I'm passionate about my, um, my, my job and I'm uh, passionate about um, managing and researching shoulders. So hopefully this evening I'll be able to give you some information that's useful for you. So what I'm going to do is start off by just um, introducing the topic by means of discussing a little bit about the anatomy. And this is important because as we go through and talk about various shoulder problems and shoulder disorders, it's important to have an understanding of the underlying uh, cause as a result of pathology, which is related to the anatomy. Then what I'm going to be doing is running through the main disorders that we see commonly in shoulder problems, um, including rotator cuff related shoulder pain, and that encompasses impingement, uh, tendinopathy, which is one in the same that I'll explain, and rotator cuff tears. I'll talk about frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis, glenohumeral or shoulder osteoarthritis. Um, then I'll go on and briefly talk about a little bit about instability and acromioclavicular joint disorders. So trying to cover the main common problems that we see with shoulders. So how common are shoulder problems? Well, very common. And as a clinician working in the area, uh, my clinical load is probably about 95% shoulder um, conditions that I'm seeing. And they are in fact the second to third most common musculoskeletal complaint in the general population, falling behind after neck and low back pain. And 30% of us or 30% of the population are going to experience shoulder pain at some time in their life. Many people will go to their general practitioner, but many people will not go to a general practitioner, but directly go to either a physiotherapist, a chiropractor, perhaps an exercise physiologist, or a massage therapist. So although um, general practitioners can refer to um, other practitioners or health professionals, um, a lot of people will actually come directly to other health professionals. So if we think about the shoulder, it's the most mobile joint in the body. And it's the most mobile joint as a result of being a very large ball on a very shallow socket. This is unlike other joints in the body. Um, in, for example, the hip joint that is a ball and socket joint. In the hip joint, it's a very deep socket and a very small boil, ball. So there is a lot more stability in that joint. So if we think about it as the ball um, on the, the golf ball on the golf tee. You can imagine that there's a lot of inherent movement. There's a lot of potential instability. Um, and there's a lot of things that potentially can go wrong. 
So if we think about the anatomy now, and I'll just touch on this fairly briefly, just to give you a background, and a lot of you will have a fair knowledge of this, but basically when we're talking about the shoulder complex or problems with the shoulder area, we're talking about not just one joint, but we're talking about a number of joints and a number of structures. So we've got the scapula or shoulder blade, the arm bone or humerus, collarbone, clavicle, and the sternum, which is the breastbone. So these bones are joined obviously by joints and those joints don't move in isolation, but they articulate as a, as a group. We've got the glenohumeral joint, which is the big ball and socket, the acromioclavicular joint, which is where the clavicle meets the acromion. And the acromion is the point of your shoulder that you can feel when you come up to the point there and just feel that bone at the end. That's the acromion, which is a little shelf of bone, which your the ball in the ball and socket joint sits underneath, and that's part of the scapula. So we've then got the sternoclavicular joint, which is between the breastbone and the collarbone, and then the scapulothoracic joint. And the scapulothoracic joint is very important when we're talking about shoulder disorders because it's the shoulder blade sitting on the chest wall that affords a lot of the stability in the shoulder. And without that being stable, the arm bone or the arm, as we see it um, when we're doing activities, is basically not able to be stabilized in space. So the analogy I often draw with my patients is, it's no good having, if you've got a crane and you're trying to lift something or use that crane, which is a long lever, if the, the base of the crane is moving around. So quite often we're addressing problems with this scapulothoracic joint. So other than the bones and joints, we've got muscles, ligaments and capsule. And I guess the, the thing that comes to most people's mind is the rotator cuff muscles, are the rotator cuff muscles. So the rotator cuff muscles are very important. They're four small muscles that sit on the shoulder blade, on the scapula, and they they come on the scapula and their tendons uh, come out and form on, uh, attach onto the humerus or the arm bone, just at the around the head of the humerus. So unlike tendons in other parts of the body that are more cord-like, the tendon, which is the attachment of the muscle to the bone, the tendons of the rotator cuff muscles form a sheet of tendon. And that sheet of tendon is a continuous cuff underneath that point of the shoulder or the acromion that I mentioned earlier. So these muscles are very important as they obviously are involved in rotation of our arm. They're involved in assisting elevation as we move our arm away from the body. But really importantly, they act as the centering device as we lift our arm to keep that head of the humerus centered in the socket and centered under the acromion. So you can imagine as I start to talk about problems, there's quite a lot that can go wrong with the rotator cuff. So if we just pause from that for a moment and think about the larger muscles, and these are muscles that everyone is very familiar with. They're muscles that people tend to work out if they're doing workouts in gyms. And this is the deltoid, biceps, triceps, lat dorsi and pec muscles. And they're the big muscles that we can actually see and have definition. They can be issues in the shoulder um, and they can be a problem in conjunction with these small rotator cuff muscles. The shoulder, as I mentioned, is very mobile and in order to afford stability, we have a capsule. So the capsule is, acts as a restraint in the shoulder. So it's made up of, of a fibrous substance which is reinforced by a number of ligaments. And that shoulder capsule basically keeps that ball sitting nicely in the socket. But it's not a dynamic structure as the rotator cuff tendons are and rotator cuff muscles are. It's a passive restraint of the shoulder. So things can go wrong with that joint capsule, as I'll explain. Um, and it's can, in, in terms of either becoming tight or it can be, be loose so in, in, in terms of instability or potential dislocations. As I mentioned, the lig there are ligaments that reinforce that capsule around the glenohumeral joint and also there are ligaments around the acromioclavicular joint, sternoclavicular joints. Then we've got um, the bursi, which is plural for bursa. And there are bursae around most of our joints. And what a bursa is, 
it's sort of how I, uh, how I think about it, it's a bit like an airbag. It's a fluid fill sac that acts as protection for tendons. And bursae can become inflamed, and that would be what we would call bursitis, which many of you have heard of. So that is a very quick run through the anatomy, and I think it's important that there's a, a reasonable le level of understanding of these anatomical structures because understanding biomechanically how they work as, a, as either a dynamic control or as a restraint is going to really um, make us understand the different problems that we have with the shoulder. So if I just show that um, pictorially, on the left you can see there the muscles of the rotator cuff that are sitting on the scapula. And then on the right, you can also see how that muscle then forms that nice what sheet of white tendon here that is encompassed all the way around the head of the humerus. So we've got the rotator cuff muscle, the subscapularis, which is at the front, and its tendon is attaching and merging with those other tendons to form a nice cuff sitting underneath this acromion here, which is on the point of the shoulder. So that's looking at it in, a, in two dimensions. So if we think now about rotator cuff related shoulder pain, and this is the term that is encompasses things that basically go wrong with the rotator cuff. So the main things that we talk about here are ten, problems with the tendons or a tendinopathy, which is the correct terminology these days. We refer to it as tendinopathy because it's a pathology of those tendons rather than tendinitis, which um, implies that there is inflammation, and it may not always be that case. So tendinopathy is essentially those rotator cuff tendons having an issue. It may be inflammatory or it may actually be degenerative, depending on the situation, and I'll talk about that in a minute. What impingement means, and that's a term that you will hear, means that the tendon, which may be inflamed or degenerative or potentially have a tear, that tendon is pinching against the acromion. So we refer to the, to the problem as impingement syndrome or impingement or tendinopathy or rotator cuff tendinopathy or supraspinatus tendinopathy. They're all terms that are interchangeable. So I'm going to talk about that and the, the, how that presents and how we manage that in a moment. But also we think about rotator cuff tear. Rotator cuff tendons are reasonably thick. They're a few millimetres thick. And that tendon, as it rubs under the acromion, can become worn. Um, and we, can, we it may only be torn partway through the thickness of the tendon, which we would call a partial thickness tear. Or it could be torn the whole way through, and that would be a full thickness tear. And those tears are measured and the size of the tear is significant into how we may manage that. So the, the way they will present, and I will discuss this, is very similarly to impingement and sometimes it's hard to differentiate. Um, and that doesn't necessarily alter our management, which I'll talk about. So who gets problems with their rotator cuff? Well, anyone can, um, in particular if you're doing a lot of repetitive overhead activity or activity away from your body. Also, people can have problems if they're just in sustained positions. If you drive for a long period of time, use a computer with poor posture for a long period of time, um, that can also mean that the muscles become weakened and you lose that dynamic control. Obviously, dynamic control or a, or a problem with a tendon can um, result in wear and wear and tear, and that may go on to become a tendon tear. Um, so the, the two things can progress, um, it may never progress to a tear, but it can progress to a tear. Also, obviously, there is trauma. So if someone has a fall um, or is involved in some sort of a wrenching injury or many other sorts of instances, you can have trauma and that might just inflame the tendon, it might tear the tendon, but it certainly can be, res be responsible for rotator cuff related shoulder pain. There are, of course, other conditions that are systemic in nature or, or from within our bodies itself. And some of the lifestyle factors that can affect tendon pathology include obesity and smoking. So I've kind of talked a bit about some of, some of the potential um, risk factors or some things that may be responsible for this kind of pain. But what we have to always remember with any pathology that we're talking about in the body, that age is important. An old person with a tear, with a tendon that has perhaps 
undergone some degenerative process over time, may not take a great deal of force to tear, because as we know, as we get older, our tissue structures become less um, strong. And so as we get older, it may be more likely that some relatively small incident can result in more damage or tear. Whereas a young person, it may well take a lot of trauma, a lot of force to actually re result in a tendon tear. So age is an important factor to consider. So if we come back to impingement and if we think about the te tendinopathy, it's where, as I mentioned, that those tendons get pinched against the acromion, as you can see here in this diagram. And it occurs when they come up and that the head of the humerus pinches in between. And as I've said, can be as a result of trauma, can be as a result of poor muscle control and or degenerative processes. So it doesn't necessarily have to be inflammation. It can just be that that tendon is weakened. Oops, sorry, I've gone one too far. Sorry. Okay, rotator cuff tear though is, is can be a progression of impingement or tendinopathy, and that is when one or more of the rotator cuff tendons tear. It can be degenerative or it can result from trauma, and as I've mentioned, the age of the person is significant and relevant. So how do people, people present with this problem? Well, they get pain over their shoulder and upper arm. They often describe it as pinching when they use their arm away from their body or overhead. There are other characteristics of the pain, such as not li lying on that side at night. Um, it may be a constant pain if it's inflamed. Um, it may just be when they do a lot of activity, but it tends to be fairly localized pain and it's pain with particular movements. Rotator cuff tears present very similarly and it's often very difficult to differentiate the two. Um, a large tear, however, and a tear as a result of trauma might result in more constant pain and that person might have, have considerable weakness that they may either describe or may become apparent on examination. So how do we diagnose it? Well, we listen carefully to the patient's history and we take into account things such as past history, trauma, um, activities, aggravating factors, etc. And then we examine our patient and we look at their posture. And remember, I talked about um, scapulothoracic movement. So we look at how that shoulder blade is sitting on the chest wall. We look at range of motion, muscle strength. And then, of course, we do some palpation and then we do some special tests. And one of the tests, which is shown in this diagram, is actually just putting the arm into a provocative position for that rotator cuff. So it's lifting the arm away from the body and then pulling the arm, the, the lower part of the arm downwards, which is what we call internal rotation to see if that causes pinching. There may be instances where we need investigations, but not in every situation. So if we're suspicious of a tear or if we feel that maybe we're just unsure of what pathology may be going on, it may be appropriate to order an ultrasound or an MRI. And uh, however, just bear in mind that there is often a poor correlation between what we see and there's often a lot of people may have rotator cuff tears and be completely asymptomatic. So we must use any information we get from radiology um, with caution because x-rays can demonstrate osteoarthritis and if we're talking about rotator cuff related shoulder pain, it will also may show where that rotator cuff is inserting if that has been wearing for a long period of time. We can see that on a plain x-ray, so that is valuable. An x-ray can also demonstrate whether that head of humerus is rising up, which might indicate that there is no tendon um, pulling that down or indeed that there may be a tear. An ultrasound can demonstrate, because that's a dynamic test, so it is, it is actually assessing movement. It might demonstrate a thick tear and it might also be able to demonstrate that pinching. And MRIs um, may not be quite so routinely used and they're used more when there may be suspicion of a tear and that can give more valuable information such as information about muscle quality. And if an MR, if a tendon tear maybe has been long standing, that might actually influence whether or not that it is possible to repair. So there's a number of investigations that assist our diagnosis, but we should not use in isolation. And it's important when we're taking a history, and as I'm a physiotherapist and as, as doctors do, that we listen to the patient and we work out what's going on. And we use these investigations if they are going to affect our management, either in terms of our treatment as a physiotherapist or whether or not that person needs to be referred. 
So how do we manage these patients? Well, one of the most important things is to let the patient know what is aggravating their problem and try as much as we can within their lifestyle to minimise those activities, whether it's overhead activities or activities away from the body. Very importantly, as I've mentioned, we might work on correcting that scapulothoracic positioning. So where the, the scapula sits on the chest wall. And sometimes that can be quite frustrating because people don't understand the importance of that unless it's explained. Sometimes we might need to do some local modalities that help with um, just easing that pain. And as physiotherapists, we sometimes use taping to unload the, the area and then strengthen up muscles in pain-free ranges with, with um, things such as TheraBand or the elastic bands, and then progress on to appropriate strengthening exercises as we have got good control of that shoulder. So this is just, just diagrammatically shows using some of the TheraBand, it shows how we might tape that person's shoulder. So if we're using physiotherapy as management of the patient, we've got a number of options. If we don't manage to settle that person's pain down with conservative measures, sometimes a, cortis a, intra, a subacromial sorry, cortisone injection may be appropriate. So that is a corticosteroid injection that is put under the acromion and that um, provides some um, inflammatory um, relief or if the tendon is inflamed. And really what that is doing is giving us an opportunity then to try and get better control of that ball in the socket. So it's not a treatment option in isolation. It should be used together with education, minimising aggravating activities and re-establishing better control of the muscles around the shoulder. Because if we don't do that, what will happen is that at the end of that period of time that the injection is working, the patient will return to having symptoms. If the patient fails to respond, the surgery that can be done is what we call an acromioplasty or a decompression, where part of that bone is removed. But that doesn't negate the fact that the patient then needs to have exercises and re-establishment of, of good shoulder control. With rotator cuff tears, these, these can present very similarly to tendinopathy or impingement. And the management really depends on the size of the patient, uh, the, sorry, the size of the tear and the age of the patient. But often the, the management is very similar. So a large tear in an active patient though may require surgery. And, um, but large, if the, if, if the tendon tears are very large and involve a lot of the, the um, rotator cuff, they may be inoperable, but we can still try and treat those patients to give them a functional arm by getting other muscles to work. So often the treatment is very similar, but some people will go on to rotator cuff surgery. That may be arthroscopic or it may be open and more commonly today it's done arthroscopically. So that's with the keyhole surgery. It generally involves wearing a sling for a period of up to six weeks. And again, it involves a reasonable period of rehabilitation that can last for many months. So it's not a quick fix. It's not like having your appendix out that you're fine and you go home the next day and it's all fine. Any tendon surgery, any repairs like this involve a period of immobility or relative immobility, followed by a period of rehab and general uh, return to um, strengthening. So just a recap before I go on to talk about frozen shoulders is rotator cuff tendinopathy um, or uh, rotator cuff related shoulder pain is very common. It can be a progressive problem. It can be something that affects only people in a one-off situation if it's managed well. It can be as a result of trauma or degenerative changes. So if I move now and talk about what we call painful stiff shoulder, and this is really the, the term that we use now for the name of adhesive capsulitis or what a lot of people know as frozen shoulder. So this is a problem that is to do with the capsule. So remember I mentioned the capsule that acts as the restraint. And a frozen shoulder or a painful stiff shoulder can be what we call either a primary or a secondary. So primary for no known reason, just all of a sudden or for over a period of, of, of time, you develop a frozen shoulder. Or it can be secondary, which might be as a result of trauma or surgery or maybe having had a fracture. Um, so it can be something that is, um, we can directly attribute the stiffness in that shoulder to um, a, a known cause. 
So primary or idiopathic frozen shoulder, this is the condition that it can just come for no particular reason. And it's classified traditionally in three stages, and, they, and I've outlined those there. Although today we often just talk about the painful phase, followed by the stiff phase. And it, what's really important to remember is that it's not, you don't sort of go into nine months and then the pain goes and then the stiffness resolves after 12 months. So it's a continuum. And some people may fit into this time frame. Other people, it may be a lot quicker and other people, it may take longer. So it's a continuum where the pain is the initial pre pre presenting feature and then stiffness can ensue and then it gradually resolves. And I guess the, the comforting thing about frozen shoulder is it does resolve, it does get better, um, and it's something that um, can be very painful, but it does get better. So who gets a frozen shoulder? Um, so traditionally we talk about a two to five percent incidence, percentage incidence in the general population. Females tend to have this problem more commonly than males, and it affects that middle age group. So it's not a condition we see in young people, and it's not a condition we see in, in much older people. It's something in that middle age group, um, and it tends to be more females than males. There has been some research to suggest that there could be a genetic predisposition. Um, that has not been um, particularly um, uh, particularly found out to be necessarily particularly accurate, but there's been some suggestion of that. And certainly when um, we see people with frozen shoulder, they'll often describe another family member having had one. It's not uncommon to see the um, unaffected shoulder affected rarely at the same time, generally at some period later. Um, Interestingly, we don't, we do see it, but uh, my suspicion is that people that start to get a problem on the other side may well recognise that themselves and do things not to let themselves go down the track of having the disability of a frozen shoulder for quite so long. What we do know and what is very apparent is that there is a much higher incidence in the diabetic population, which would indicate that there is some systemic component to this problem. And certainly when we see frozen shoulder in the diabetic population, it tends to be a lot nastier. Their pain is more, is more significant and their period of time that they have the frozen shoulder can be more protracted. So the diabetics do it really tough when they have frozen shoulder. We do know, according to the literature, and we certainly see this in clinical practice, that there are other diagnoses that go, uh, that are coexisting with uh, frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis. And that includes issues with the thyroid, Dupuytren's disease, which has a strong association. And Dupuytren's disease is where fingers can get, can become contracted and curl down. So many of you will have seen this. Um, and really interestingly, Dupuytren's disease, which is most commonly reported in the hand, is more common in the older age population, so people over 70, and tends to be more common in males. So although there is a very strong link between these two disorders, the population that get them are quite, are quite separate. And other coexisting um, diagnoses include um, heart disease and um, TB and interestingly Parkinson's disease. And I recently did a small project looking at the incidence of a painful stiff shoulder being one of the early symptoms of Parkinson's disease, which we found in our population that we studied um, was the case and that has also been reported in the literature. Okay. So how do we diagnose um, a frozen shoulder? So obviously if you have a painful stiff shoulder and you've got a lot of restriction of movement, it can be quite easy to work out what's going on. But when it's difficult to diagnose is in that really early stage and in that early stage when pain is the predominant feature. So it's really important, again, we listen and, and as clinicians, we listen to our patient and listen to what they, they describe as the pain because it, they describe the pain on the pain that, that, that people feel with this is quite different to impingement or rotator cuff pain. So it's difficult to, to diagnose in the early stage and it's often really confused with, with impingement or tendonitis. 
And as it, as I said, as it progresses and it gets stiffer, it does become easy, easier to recognise. But it's really important that we can pick this early and that, that someone comes and is able to identify it early because if the patient goes down the wrong track um, or the person goes down the wrong track, it can be protract the whole issue. And this is the whole problem. This is an area that I did my research in um, a few years ago because I think that, that as a clinician that it's not hard to recognise but yet I, I get frustrated when so many people have, have been treated for impingement when it's actually something else. So, so how does it present? Well, it's different depending on the stages I've mentioned. And it, it, there, there may be a history of trauma or it might just be insidious or come for no reason. The location of the pain is different to impingement. It's more of a general pain and it's more of an ache or a sickening type of pain that's aggravated by quick movements or when that person gets to the end of their range. Often people have had investigations and those investigations, including ultrasound, may show um, that there is impingement, but that is not necessarily um, relevant um, because if the shoulder is tight, it it is likely to show um, it's likely to show that anyway. So in the early stage, and this is what I did some research on myself, I came up with these eight criteria that were determined by consensus of experts. And there's this strong component of night pain. People don't like quick or unguarded movements. That's quite distinctive that they get this sickening feeling of pain um, and it's pain in this area of their shoulder. They don't like lying on that side. That's not particularly diagnostic. But the pain is really easily aggravated by any movement. And in particular, there is pain at the end of the range of motion in all directions. And that differs from tendon problems, which won't necessarily have pain in all directions. They might have pain in elevation and perhaps hand behind their back, but it won't be global as it is with a frozen shoulder. And if you think back to the anatomy that I described earlier, because it's a capsule, it's because that the, the, uh, the head of the humerus is hitting up against that capsule in all of those directions. So in terms of radiology, um, it can be useful to eliminate other problems such as osteoarthritis, which I'll talk about in a minute, because they very, have very similar presentations. Um, an arthrogram may show that there's a decreased joint volume, but really by the time someone's going to show that on that investigation, it's going to be apparent anyway that they have that. Doppler ultrasound, which is a, a means of looking at vascularity, can look at the front of the shoulder. And I did some work on this and we find that the, the front of the shoulder becomes, shows up inflammation early in a frozen shoulder. And also an MRI can demonstrate thickening. But again, by that stage, the patient will be easy to, to, to diagnose clinically because there is restriction of movement. So how do we treat this? Well, as a physiotherapist, if we get these early, we encourage movement. We encourage the person to stretch within their pain limits, which can be very severe. So it's encouraging movement um, and not letting that get any stiffer if that's possible. There are options of injections. Um, there are options of surgery. So, but what we need to remember though, is that this is going to get better and it's going to, be res it's going to move towards resolution in any event. So physiotherapy in terms of range of motion, stretching, massage, pain relief, medication and, and paracetamol and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories can help. Intra-articular cortisone injection, and that means the injection goes into a different place than it would for um, tendon, tendon pain. So it's not going under the acromia now, it's actually going into the joint. And that is very important because if people are diagnosed with, with a problem with their tendon, they get a subacromial injection, that won't help a frozen shoulder problem. So if there is evidence of tendinopathy on ultrasound, that may be a complete red herring in the presence of a, a frozen shoulder. Some people may also have hydrodilatation, which is a distension of the capsule. When we don't see manipulation under anaesthetic very commonly, but some surgeons will actually do a capsular release as well. So there's a number of options for treatment. So hydrodilatation, which has gained a lot of traction recently, is increasing the volume in the capsule by putting fluid into that capsule, and that's done under and uh, usually under imaging. But when you look at studies that have um, looked at hydrodilatation, it's it's interesting to compare them to not um, to other studies because when a person has hydrodilatation, they generally have a corticosteroid 
injection at the same time. And they also follow up with um, stretching exercises and physiotherapy. So it's hard to know whether it's actually the dilatation that is, is improving the situation or whether it's the fact that there's been steroid and there's been um, stretching exercises done at the same time. But it's certainly quite a popular means of managing frozen shoulder. Then of course, the, where patients can go on and have an arthroscopic release, um, which is when the capsule is released um, generally at the front because that's where it gets tight. And it's, this is, a, it is something, again, that is followed by fairly intensive physiotherapy and stretching exercises. It's uh, usually done arthroscopically, as I said, because um, when you do an open procedure, there's scarring and the healing, and in particular in diabetic patients, that may pose a problem. So again, done with the keyhole surgery to just release that capsule and then hopefully get some movement. And again, only usually done in the latter stages. So if we can get these people early, get them moving um, and not let, let people get too stiff uh, and manage their pain, hopefully the overall recovery becomes less. Okay, so just they're the main, I guess they're the main things that we see in terms of, um, uh, of really common shoulder problems, but then the, probably the next most common thing that we see is osteoarthritis. So who gets this? It's obviously an older age group as, as with most osteoarthritis, and there may be some previous history, and certainly we know genetics plays a part in osteoarthritis. People with this pain will describe a, a different type of pain. It's deep in the joint, and it might be crackling, there may be restriction of movement and night pain. It's fairly reasonably easy to diagnose on x-ray. So you can see here that the that x-ray there is demonstrating this, this is not a nice smooth joint space. There's lots of bony spurring here. And that would be a fairly severe case of osteoarthritis. So what do we do with these people or how these, how's this, this problem managed? Well, it's managed with getting mobilization, with movement, with stretches, with exercises, and obviously pain relief. And again, sometimes intra-articular or into the joint, um, corticosteroid injection can, can afford relief of the pain and allow more movement in that joint. Situations where we, we don't do well or the person progresses on and no longer do these um, more conservative measures work, there's the option of shoulder joint replacement. And we can see that done either traditionally as we see on the left picture where we've got the socket in the shoulder blade and the ball is on the end of the humerus. But more commonly today, what we're seeing is what we see on the right hand side here, which is the reverse shoulder replacement, where the ball sits on the shoulder, on the shoulder blade, and we've got the socket, which is the opposite of anatomically how we're designed. And the reason this is done is because it's done in the presence of also if there's wear and tear in the rotator cuff, because we can, this allows biomechanically for the bigger muscles to be able to use, to, to, to be used to, um, to get elevation and function. So more commonly now we're seeing uh, reverse shoulder replacements done. Okay, so osteoarthritis reasonably common and we manage it with trying to maintain range of motion. And then if that, um, if that progresses, it may go on to more, um, more aggressive management in the form of surgery. Now, conversely um, to osteoarthritis is instability or dislocations. And these are often in the younger population now. And we get a group of people that might have a, a, a general joint or capsular laxity, and they can dislocate in multiple directions, or there may be dislocation as a result of trauma. And the direction that that happens is generally the head of the humerus moves forward. So you can see here these, this description, we have the normal anatomy there. We have when the head of the humerus moves forward and there we have a posterior dislocation, which is less common. And this is the um, pattern that is most likely responsible for an anterior dislocation. This is a picture here of someone who has got a, a probably got multi-directional instability. And you can see there, that's what we call the sulcus sign. As you pull the humerus down, there is excessive play in that. And we've got that little sulcus there, which you don't see in a shoulder that's got um, a normal capsule. So glenohumeral joint um, dislocations or subluxations is something that we can manage with exercise, um, strengthening exercises. We can't change the actual structure of that capsule, um, but we can try and get better control around that shoulder joint and the scapula. 
Again, these people, unlike a frozen shoulder, which is, has the capsule released, these people might actually need to have that capsule tightened. And again, that can be arthroscopic or open surgery. And then just to finish off on, because this is something that we see, and, and we see this more commonly in sporting populations. Um, so typically what's happened to this fellow, perhaps playing um, football, um, or one of the other areas that we see, or one of the other sports that we commonly see problems with the acromioclavicular joint, or indeed fractures in the clavicle, um, is falling off cycles, uh, bicycles. Um, so the, the ACJ, um, the acromioclavicular joint, can become dislocated. So that joint is supported by ligaments, and those ligaments can be ruptured um, to a greater or lesser extent. And that's what this picture here is demonstrating, that there's the clavicle and the ligaments in between the clavicle and the acromion um, have been ruptured, and so now that is sticking up. And um, from, a, from a biomechanical point of view, that won't actually cause too many issues, but cosmetically, a lot of people don't like it and may go on to consider surgery. Um, some people don't, um, and but we certainly immobilise these people to try and get the approximation of the the, bow, the the clavicle and the acromion. We need to give that time, so we need to sort of get people to perhaps back off their activity. Um, we need to make sure that people don't get secondary problems um, in terms of wasting of muscles and secondary joint problems. And of course, surgery can be an option where that is stabilised surgically, that joint. Um, and again, very frequently done arthroscopically, and it might be done from a, uh, from a for an, an early return to sport point of view or from a cosmetic point of view. And this is just showing that when we, we have these people in slings, it's really important that they're not in a broad arm sling, but that the, the elbow is supported pushing up so that we're actually approximating that um, arm bone up rather than letting it drag down as it happens in a broad arm sling. And this just shows a little bit of taping that we might also do to pull up the humerus and get that and push down the clavicle to, to get that closer together. So that is really a fairly brief run through about giving you an outline of the major things or the common problems that we see in shoulders. Other things, of course, there are multiple other things we see and people will get pain in that area which can actually be coming from their neck or from their cervical spine. Um, so that is not an uncommon presentation. Nerve issues, so people that have problems either again from their neck or from problems um, locally, nerve issues that may result in weakness or pain. And, and also, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, dysfunction of posture. So remembering that the effect of the position of the shoulder blade on the chest wall can certainly affect the biomechanics of the shoulder and um, result in problems with the shoulder. And although I've spoken about these, a lot of these conditions in isolation, you can have osteoarthritis and a rotator cuff tear. So things can go together. Um, so I'm very happy to take some questions. I realise it's been a quick run through, but hopefully given you a little bit of an idea of, of how things present, how common they are, why we get problems with those areas and the, the management as we see it today. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, you commented at the start of the evening how you uh, had been teaching and lecturing all day. Well, you've, con you've certainly maintained the standard tonight. So that was a beautifully clear uh, explanation of, of the various um, shoulder problems and so on. So uh, and to start off with that explanation of the anatomy was, uh, was very beneficial. Uh, we have got a couple of questions that have come through. So if anyone else has any questions they want to pop into the question box now, please do so. Um, Sarah, you mentioned about um, uh, the difference between a normal and you mentioned the normal and reverse replacement, shoulder replacement. Um, question here about what does rehabilitation and, and the outcome look like? Um, the question is coming from a woman who, or a person who is um, 58 years old um, and also has scleroderma. So I guess whenever there's other sort of uh, co-conditions, co um, that, that can all, always um, make things potentially more difficult. So just in relation to the two different shoulder replacements and what you know of my, what might be the potential outcomes. Okay, so um, any any shoulder surgery, repl joint replacement surgery, obviously has to be done for a particular individual um, and consider that person's individual requirements um, 
So as I mentioned, traditionally it would be done anatomically, so we would have ball and socket the same. Um, so in someone who's 58, um, it may well be that a replacement for osteoarthritis in an otherwise um, healthy shoulder in terms of muscles and tendons, it would be done in the normal anatomical way. But if someone has um, rotator cuff damage um, or tear, or if those soft tissues, say with scleroderma, which is what this um, person is speaking about, which may affect those soft tissues, and the function of the rotator cuff is not good, it may be that the option is to do a reverse. And that means that when you do the reverse, you are not relying on the rotator cuff to work um, to give it the function. So I think the question was, how, how much function do people get after that? And I mean, the aim, the aim of any surgery is to maximise function. And um, my experience, and I work with a surgeon who does both, um, but more reverse these days than, um, than anatomical, um, is that the function is very good. Um, that range of motion is nearly always um, close to normal, although it may be a little bit restricted. Um, and pain relief, which is why people usually go for, for that sort of surgery, is usually very good. Um, sometimes a person has to lower their expectations um, in terms of can they swim a long way or will they return to tennis or so it, 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 sometimes expectations have to be lowered a little bit. Um, again, it depends on the individual. So. My experience is that the outcome is usually good, but then, of course, the outcome is dependent on why that surgery is being performed. So I think it's very individual. So hopefully that oh, answers that thank question. You. Thank you. Uh, another question here, is continued shoulder pain from immunisation common and can it be treated? Ooh, um, that's probably out of my musculoskeletal uh, realm. Um, I, so I guess people are referring to COVID immunisation, which I think is probably, um, I, I have heard people having that as, as ongoing. I certainly haven't as a clinician come across that. Um, so um, can, I think the question, Jen, was can that be cured? Is that what you were, is that, was that the question? Yes. Um, can it be treated? Can it be treated? I guess... Uh, I guess anything can be treated if we, I mean, we need to know why that is being experienced. Has there been some damage to the muscle? Um, so I guess the short answer is I don't know because I haven't come across that. And is it is it is the pain as a result of um, the, the tissue response, in which case I don't know that musculoskeletal management of that is really going to help um, per se. Mm -hmm. a bit of a and so Yes. Uh, uh, with um, I think you mentioned thyroid disease and there's a question, um, is it hyper or hypothyroid? Okay, yeah, good question. Um, probably hypothyroidism. So that's when um, someone is more active. So it's hy hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Sarah, what sort, what sorts of upper limb exercises are good for rehabilitation after surgery? Again, so is that individual or which type of surgery is this? Is this rotator cuff surgery? Um, it, it's not specified in the question. Okay, so if after rotator cuff surgery, um, the exercises that we start with are generally passive. So passive meaning the patient's not using their muscle because that puts too much load through the repair and that happens for six weeks. And then those exercises are progressed to getting the person doing things with gravity eliminated to start with, not loading things up, and then gradually progressing on to doing some strengthening exercises. Now they start, um, if we're talking about rotator cuff surgery, by just doing things that are in what we call inner range. So not moving away from the body, but getting those rotator cuff muscles working in a pain-free, range, so low down, um, below shoulder height. And then as the person gets better control of the ball in the socket, if you like, then we can start to incorporate exercises moving away from the body. And that might be with free weights or that might be with um, uh, TheraBand. Um, it can be a number of different things that we, we use to strengthen. So it, it is individual and very much so if we're talking about post-operative um, exercises broad routines or 
broad uh, outlines are usually described by the surgeon. So some surgeons don't mind um, getting patients moving very quickly. Other surgeons are much more conservative and take a slower approach. So I think um, with surgery, always respect what your surgeon is saying about you. Um, some people have better quality tendon than others if we're talking about rotator cuff repair. Um, sometimes um, we might need to take things more slowly. In terms of joint replacement, um, if bone, um, bone stock has not been good, uh, again, we might need to be a little bit more careful. Um, things like that. So it, it does tend to be individual, but speaking broadly, we get range of motion followed by strengthening in an inner range or low down and then progressing to be more specific to that person's needs. Mm -hmm. And in relation to frozen, frozen shoulder, what signs suggest that hydrodilation might be helpful for frozen shoulder? And how many hydrodilations can a person have for one frozen shoulder? And what duration between them? Okay, so um, hydrodilatation is basically trying, well, uh, yeah, before I speak about that, remember a frozen shoulder is going to get better with time. So regardless of the management that you give, it is going to slowly progress to getting better. So having hydrodilatation may well speed that process up by um, stretching that capsule out followed by exercises. How many should you have? Well, I, I think people generally wouldn't have them. You don't keep going and having hydrodilatation because you, the, the whole the whole issue of the, the frozen shoulder or the adhesive capsulitis, it's resolving over time anyway. So all you're really doing is trying to speed up that process. Um, so my experience would be that you, most people would only ever need one if they, if they follow that up by doing appropriate exercises. So as I mentioned, you don't just have that in isolation. That is done together with stretching exercises. And again, is it the stretching exercises or is it the hydrodilatation that's working? So if someone is needing more than one, perhaps they're not doing their stretching exercises um, or it's just very recalcitrant. But ultimately frozen shoulders get better. So when someone has asked, what's the difference between a ligament and a tendon? Good question. Okay, so a, a tendon is the attachment of the muscle to the bone. So all of the muscle is the red meaty part that we see. And what the tendon is, it's it's got no blood supply. So it's where the, um, the muscle forms that white tendon and the tendon attaches to the bone. So it is the thing that is pulling on the bone. That So the muscle works by the tendon pulling on the bone. A ligament is a, uh, is a structure that basically goes across a joint, so it's not attached to a muscle, and it reinforces that joint. So a ligament is a stabilising, has a stabilising function. So we have ligaments across all of our joints, um, and they stabilise the joint to stop movement in a particular direction, as opposed to a tendon, which is, is the dynamic move or the movement of the muscle on the bone. Hmm. Um, Sarah, the question, can autoimmune or different forms of autoimmune arthritis also affect the shoulders? And if so, in what way? So, yeah, so you can have um, other forms of particularly arthritis around the shoulder. So psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and they're systemic diseases. Um, and they can present with, um, they do present differently. Um, um, and I guess, again, that is very individual. So those sorts of systemic arthropathies that we would call them um, are more inflammatory. And so people with those sorts of disorders will present with um, often pain, like joint related pain, um, but it's, it's inflammatory. So osteoarthritis is wear and tear arthritis, whereas some of those systemic um, conditions are more inflammatory. And so the person will have more pain um, and um, again the principles are the same that we maintain range of motion we try and control the pain these people but people with those which there may be some people in the audience um, they're probably their pain management is uh, is more um, oral steroids and um, as opposed to local steroids to treat those those joints but um, managing the pain with medication or with heat or with some things that we can use from physiotherapy point of view, range of motion, 
um, exercises, again, important and strengthening as able. So some of those um, systemic um, pathologies can also affect tendon quality. So in people with rheumatoid arthritis, for example, um, the tendon quality may not be quite as good. And also, Sarah, um, what is, what is the, your prognosis of rotator cuff tendinopathy? What is the prognosis? So it depends on the management, I think, and, and it depends on the person. So if the person is very compliant and stops or minimises the activity and gives the opportunity for that tendon to settle down, then we can re-establish good control. I think the prognosis is very good. Um, so it, it is individual, um, but if that person has a tendon tear and they continue to aggravate it, um, it may well be that that's not going to settle down conservatively. But my experience with the people that I manage um, is that we have a beginning, a middle and an end, and um, sometimes they will stir up something down the track and I might see them again, but our aim is to have an episode and get that episode well under control. So I think they've got a good prognosis if they're managed well. Hmm. Um, also, someone's asking, uh, what can you suggest uh, regarding treatment for a six millimetre tear and large hematoma in, in this person's arm, uh, as well as oste osteoarthritis, bursitis and tendonitis? <laughs> Um, again, it's hard to sort of to, to speak about individual patients' problems. Mm -hmm. if, if someone has a hematoma, that suggests to me that there's been some sort of trauma. Um, so it's very hard with um, sort of listening to what may be going on. And a six millimetre tear on its own may not be causing a problem. If there's a hematoma there, that may be as a result of some other trauma. Um, if there's osteoarthritis, so you know, again, I, any of any of the um, sorts of symptoms that people describe has to be done in context of that person's age, What ha what's the history, what's the past history. So it's really hard to sort of speak on an individual level. Um, a six millimetre tear on its own may not be a big issue, um, but it may be if it's really inflamed. But I guess the hematoma to me indicates it's some sort of trauma. Yes, and this is a good question, Sarah. What is the recommended exercise um, regimen for frozen shoulder? I'm oh, sorry, no, that wasn't the one I was wanting. A pretty healthy elderly person, what what would you suggest or what sort of a group of exercises or routines would you suggest to avoid the things you need, that you've talked about? Okay, so that's a good person, question. Um, yes, this person is healthy and wants to avoid these things. Yeah, prevention, great. Um, I guess the big thing is to maintain activity and maintain range of motion. So as we get older, um, things get tighter and stiffer and that's going to predispose you more to wearing on a smaller surface area. So maintaining range of motion, um, uh, exercises that are good. So what I would suggest is that if the, if the person is um, older, and when I say older, I don't mean old, old, but just, you know, sort of getting past 60 or 65, um, don't add in too big a load um, because a big load and working big muscles, so biceps curls and doing all these gym junkie kinds of exercises can actually create quite an imbalance of those poor little rotator cuff muscles that are paddling like mad behind to try and catch up. So just doing general strengthening, so light gym exercises with the emphasis on light, um, not trying to build up too big, bigger muscles, but we know that having strong muscles is important and we know that as we get older that the muscle um, quality and the muscle strength weakens. So light weights. So even just um, being um, functional at home and making sure that you're using your arm for like lifting bags of groceries and, you know, doing things around the house is actually, unfortunately today we've got a lot of these labour saving devices, um, but they also are not very good for our bodies because we don't get that sort of functional strength that we are designed to, to do. So mm -hmm. putting things in and out of cars and, you know, carrying groceries, but more specifically, if you want to do light weights, just, you know, a kilo or so and doing lots of repetitions of, of light weights, but not great big flies away from the body, um, you know, doing things close into the body and maybe some, some light swimming breaststrokes, some exercises in water. Again, it depends on the person's age and the quality of their muscle. Yeah, great, great answer. Thank you, Sarah. And look, we're, we're just right on 8pm, uh, so we are going to finish now. Apologies to those people who uh, put in a question, but it hasn't been answered. 
Um, for people who have a, a particular question, I suggest you speak to your health professional uh, about that if you have some concerns. But look, once again, thank you everyone for joining us. Sarah, thank you so much. That was just such a beautifully clear presentation and made it um, just very easily understood, I'm sure, by everyone who's viewed this tonight. And of course, the recording will be available freely on our website for people to view into the future. So thanks very much, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. Could you please fill in the, um, the uh, feedback survey, which will come on your screens uh, as we sort of bid you good night. So uh, best wishes, everyone, and thanks for joining this evening. Thank you. Bye, everyone.